On the evening of the 14th of April last, the body of an infant child was discovered on a sandy beach near Carasavin in County Kerry. The body was in a plastic bag and had suffered multiple stab wounds. The discovery... On the 14th of April 1984, a baby boy would be found dead after washing up on White Strand in Carasavin, County Kerry. Carasavin town has a population of around 1,200 people and is one of the westernmost towns in Ireland. It has remained principally a market town and has never fully enjoyed the benefits of the tourist industry, making it one of the most original towns of the Ring of Kerry. So on to the Ring of Kerry next and just a quick explanation for those not in the know. The Ring of Kerry is a scenic drive that's a 179 km circular route that takes in the rugged coastal landscape and rural seaside villages in the southwest of Ireland. This next segment may be triggering to some of my watchers out there and I'm very sorry. But for those not from Ireland, they would not be familiar with what the Catholic and state-run institutes did to the Irish women, young girls, children and babies. And I feel it's relevant to the story. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to delve into the past further than 1984. So you all have an understanding of Ireland back in the day. If you were a woman or a young girl and you happened to find yourself in the family way, as they put it, and didn't have a ring on your finger or someone to put one on you, you would end up being socially ostracised or put into a government institute run by the Catholic Church or even put into a mental home and have your baby stolen from you and adopted out to families at home and abroad. It unnerves me even thinking about it as I know how these poor girls and women were treated and what happened to some of them and their babies. I won't be diving too far into the rabbit hole or I just won't be able to finish the video on time. A commission was established in Ireland in 2015 to provide a full account of what happened to vulnerable women and children in these church institutions during the period 1922 to 1998. What emerged from these testimonies is cruelty to pregnant young women and the pure neglect of their infants by religious orders who saw them as sinful and deserving of punishment. Would you may ask yourself what happened to the women and girls that didn't go through the system, who kept their so-called illegitimate babies, who had the support of a loving family, who helped them keep the baby and raise it in a family environment. How did they fare in society? How were they looked at? I guess the story will tell you for sure. On Saturday the 14th of April 1984, a local farmer was out for a jog. I have to say I did try and imagine a farmer jogging in the 80s or even nowadays. I don't think I've ever seen such a sight unless there were cows or sheep in front of them and he was wearing big wellies and wailing a big stick. The farmer's name was Jack Griffin, a keen runner. He had just stopped to check on some cattle when he spotted what he initially thought might be a doll but it came apparent that it was a baby with a mop of dark hair. Jack ran to his brother-in-law's house and called the Gardaí. They arrived not long after, along with the undertaker, Tom Curran. Tom baptised the baby boy using water from a nearby stream and named him John, apparently after a beloved uncle. The state pathologist arrived and baby John was brought for a post-mortem. He was found among the rocks, he was naked and in a plastic bag. It was discovered that he had been stabbed 28 times to the front of his torso and it was determined that this was the cause of death, which will be significant further into the story. Baby John was just five days old. Because he was found Saturday night, he would not be buried until Monday. So when Tom the Undertaker collected him from the morgue and brought him back to the funeral home, to prepare him for burial. Tom stayed with baby John the whole time as he had nobody and he didn't want him to be alone. On the Monday, Tom organized for the school children to attend the funeral, including his 15 year old daughter, Catherine. Unfortunately, this little boy is going to get lost in this story as often the victims do. The night before baby John was found 80 kilometers away from Carasavine in County Kerry, a woman named Joanne Hayes went into labour on the family farm in Abbey Dorney, also in County Kerry, where she lived with her mother and two brothers, Mike and Ned, and her sister Kathleen. 
Joanne was on her own in the hay shed when she gave birth to a little boy, which she named Shane. Unfortunately, the baby did not survive the birth. Nobody knew she was pregnant and had given birth, not even her family. So the next day, Joanne hid baby Shane on the farm. Joanne Hayes was 24 years old and a single mother to her daughter, Yvonne. The father, Yvonne, was a married man that Joanne had been seeing named Jeremiah Locke and he was also the father of baby Shane that had just died. This is a family that embraced Joanne and her daughter and made sure she didn't end up in one of the institutions or have Joanne give up her daughter for adoption. They were extremely close, tight-knit family and they let no judgment or social restraints prevent Joanne from being a mother to her daughter in the security of the family home. The murder squad was contacted in Dublin once the results of baby John's post-mortem were released. Six members of the murder squad descended on Catterside town, led by Superintendent John Courtney. With him were two specialist interrogators, Detective Sergeant Jerry O'Carroll and Detective Garda PJ Brown. Officers checked all local maternity hospitals for details of recent pregnancies. They also kept an ear to the ground for any gossip or rumours. The squad were in plain clothes, as in suits, so they stuck out like a sore thumb among the locals. They asked the young girls if they had heard of any older girls running around with married men, or knew if there was anyone that was secretly pregnant or recently had a baby. The murder squad got word of a young woman, Joanne Hayes, who had recently been in hospital after suffering a miscarriage but the doctors believed she had gone full term. Now Joanne and her family are immediately under suspicion. In Tralee, the main town in Kerry, a case conference was held at the Garda station and Superintendent Courtney outlined how baby John died and he incorrectly states that he was stabbed in the back a number of times. On Tuesday the 1st of May, detectives were dispatched to the Hayes family farm and the family were brought in for questioning and other detectives went to Joanne's workplace, the Tralee Regional Sports and Leisure Centre, and also brought her in for questioning. They put them all into separate interview rooms and Jerry O'Carroll and PJ Brown were tasked with interviewing Joanne. They were interviewed for 12 hours with no breaks and no food. Joanne was roared at and shouted at. They banged their fists on tables and even at one stage, Joanne claimed that PJ Brown slapped her across the face twice, while O'Carroll stood by watching. Ned and Mick were to suffer the same type of abuse, getting punched in the kidneys and put on the ground, held down with the detective's knee on their back and their heads pulled back. They were told they wouldn't be let home unless they signed the statements. The detectives kept coming in and out with different bits of information claiming the other members of the family were admitting to doing certain things and they did the same with Joanne. They told Joanne that if she didn't sign the statement her daughter would be adopted, her mother would be charged with murder and the farm would be sold. After the beatings and the threats they all gave in and signed the false confessions. You have to remember this family were from a remote part of Ireland, never in trouble with the law, lived a simple farming life probably had a basic education with no knowledge of their rights and of course it was the 80s where aggressive interview techniques would be common practice. The harassment, the mental and physical abuse the family said was something else. Even though the whole family told the truth, they were guilty according to the detectives. Joanne thought the guardie had found her baby on the farm and this is why she was being brought in for questioning. Joanne told detectives that she had had a baby on the 13th of April out on the farm. When the baby stopped crying, she realised the baby had died. She panicked and left him overnight in the hay barn. The next morning, she secretly hid the baby on the land. The detectives put it to her that she was the mother of baby John, which Joanne denied. Joanne pleads with detectives to let her show them where the baby was on the farm to prove she is not the mother of baby John but Superintendent Courtney didn't allow it. The guardies searched the farm several times throughout the day, but no baby was found. Eventually, after hours of intense interrogation, Joanne finally relents and admits that she is the mother of baby John. 
and she signs a statement that the detectives drew up and Joanne adds a few details of her own to it. She said she stabbed him in the back and beat him with a bath brush and killed him. Despite what Courtney had told detectives, baby John was not stabbed in the back. After they all signed the false confessions, Joanne was charged with the murder of baby John and the rest of the family were charged with concealing the birth. And they were all finally let home the next morning at around 1am, except for Joanne. She was brought down to the cells and left there until later that morning, Wednesday the 2nd of May, where she would appear at Tralee District Court and formally charged with murder. As Joanne sat in one of the consultation rooms at the courthouse, a young solicitor, Pat Mahan, was approached and asked would he go speak to Joanne. When Pat saw Joanne, she was crying and the family were very upset. This was a rural farming family sitting in the courts. It was all totally alien to them. They told the solicitor that they were kept in the station for hours. They were beaten verbally and physically abused and threatened, and they only signed the statements to get out of the station. The charges against the Hayes family were based solely on the confessions they made. Joanne managed to get a message to her sister Kathleen and it changes everything. Kathleen told the solicitor that Joanne told her where the baby was on the farm. So the family went out to the farm and in the ditch they found what they thought to be baby Shane. So they rang the solicitor and he informed the guardy. The guardy got the surprise of their lives when they saw the baby and knew straight away they had been wrong. But being wrong and admitting you were wrong are two completely different things and this would lead everyone further down the rabbit hole. After baby Shane was recovered, he was examined and the blood grouping was completely different to baby John. This leaves Superintendent Courtney and his colleagues with a huge problem. The baby found on the land had the same blood group as Joanne. It's highly unlikely she could be the mother of baby John, the baby she confessed to killing in her statement. So the detectives needed to come up with a new explanation. This segment of the story is a massive give me strength moment. So they put through a different theory. John and baby Shane were twins, but with different fathers. They claimed that Joanne had released two eggs that month and had sex with two different men and got pregnant. This is a one in a million chance of happening. Superintendent Courtney cannot find an expert witness to corroborate this new theory. So they can see that Joanne could not be the mother of baby John. But instead of dropping the case, they come up with a new theory of a third baby. They said Joanne did have twins and that one was born outside on the farm and a few hours later, when Joanne was in bed, she had a second baby. This would support the statements that were said to be given by the family, which said that Joanne did kill a baby by beating and stabbing and that the baby was then put in a plastic bag and her brothers Ned and Mick threw the baby into the sea and this baby was never recovered. Superintendent Courtney insists on proceeding with the prosecution. Joanne's cousin posted bail for her. He got a lot of phone calls from the people of Abbey Dorney and they were very angry. The Hayes family were highly respected. They were farmers with a teacher and a nun within the family. Everyone collected money to help fight a case if it was going to go ahead. Then in September 1984, five months after baby John was found, Courtney and his colleagues faced a showdown in Dublin at a meeting in the offices of the DPP, which is the Department of Public Prosecution. They are told that the prosecution cannot go ahead. The whole case just fell apart and the solicitors could not wait to get rid of it. On the 10th of October 1984, the case comes back before the court and all charges against Joanne and her family are withdrawn. Four days later, the Sunday Independent Irish newspaper breaks the story of the Kerry babies and the family who confessed to a crime that according to the forensic evidence they could not have committed. The people of Ireland asked how could this happen? Then Joanne and her family made allegations of harassment, coercion and beatings against certain officers. The detectives strongly deny any ill treatment. The story makes headlines around the country. An investigation into these allegations begins straight away. But again, we have Gardaí investigating Gardaí and not an independent inquiry. In November 1984, the Garda Commissioner sends his report to the Minister of Justice. 
In it, he concluded that the investigating officers were grossly negligent in their handling of the case. But this report is not made public at the time. The government quickly responds and the Kerry Babies Tribunal is set up and begins on the 7th of January 1985. The tribunal was to inquire into the conduct of the Gardaí and how it was that a whole family could admit to a crime they didn't commit. So essentially the Hayes family simply were witnesses to the events and that's the way it should have been. But that's not what happened. It became an absolute witch hunt. Joanne gave evidence on the eighth day of the tribunal and was in the witness box for five days, which was unheard of at the time. She is quizzed repeatedly about her relationship with Jeremiah Locke, the father of her daughter and baby Shane. She is asked over 2000 questions over five days in a room full of men, where misogyny was rampant at the time. A woman's morals were constantly under scrutiny in little old Catholic Ireland at that time. Joanne was asked about a previous miscarriage, details of her menstruation, the size of her clots, her dating history, her contraception method, her sex life and so on. This all happened in a room full of men in a public setting. This is the actual transcript of some of the questions and answers from the tribunal. Did you still hope he would leave his wife and come and live with you? I don't think so. Why then, Miss Hayes, did you allow intimacy to take place between you? Because I was in love with him. Did you think he was in love with you? He said he was. Were you having intimate relations with any other man around that time? No. You went out with somebody else? I wasn't friends with Jeremiah at that stage. Was the man you went out with, was he a married man? No. How many men were there before you went out with Jeremiah? One. Just the one? Yes. The tribunal heard an entire range of human emotions from Joanne and her family. There was love, sex and witness breakdowns. No breaks were given when asked for by Joanne. Judge Lynch would not concede to the request as he said, if we break now, we'll be breaking every five minutes. Joanne even had to be given a sedative to be able to continue in the witness box at one stage, as she was so upset by the questioning. She was in no fit state to be in the witness box. I'll say it again, it was an absolute witch hunt. It was not a tribunal about misconduct of the Gardaí, but it was turned around to make a spectacle of a young woman they considered to have loose morals that had two babies outside wedlock with a married man and they were going to punish her one way or another. If they couldn't charge her with anything, they were damn sure she would be made a show of. It was absolutely shameful. One journalist referred to Joanne as being torn like a rag doll in the witness box. And of course, the part that was forgotten in all of this was Joanne had actually lost a baby and she was a grieving mother. Superintendent Courtney brought forward a number of concocted theories to the tribunal through his solicitor. The Gardaí were taking the view that what was being alleged against them was unfounded and unacceptable and they were going to fight tooth and nail to show that they were being wrongly accused. On one of the days Joanne outlines how her statement of confession was written. The detective would put to her what happened and she would say yes. They would give her suggestions by half sentences and Joanne would finish those sentences. It was reported in the media. We're looking at the extraordinary sympathy that has developed locally and around the country for the chief witness. News reporters completely missed the mark here. Joanne was not on trial and people were outraged that Joanne as a witness was not being treated like a witness. The people saw that she was actually on trial and so they came out in force to support her and they knew it was all wrong. Why is it extraordinary that people supported her? Because she had an affair with a married man? Because she had babies outside of marriage? I think the good people of Ireland were sick of the hypocrisy of the powers in the country and were finally standing up to stop women being seen and treated as second class citizens. As Justice Lynch left the building of the tribunal, people shouted, who's on trial? and an escort of Gardaí and detectives had to see him through the crowd. On the 3rd of October 1985, Judge Lynch publishes his final report. 
Joanne is presented in the report as a malicious liar who pursued a married man. The whole family are presented as liars. But the main issue with the report that was staring people in the face was how do innocent people sign confessions and that incredibly was never the centre of the tribunal and it was never answered. Joanne was accused of murder. Not only were her family called liars, as Judge Lynch said in his own words, the family lied through their teeth. This effectively exonerated the guards. The elite murder squad that was sent to Carter Zivine at the time baby John was found was seen as a key weapon in the fight against subversives. It was a very exclusive and select unit that was picked out of the whole country. Jerry O'Carroll was one of these interrogators along with PJ Brown. They hadn't got the tools we have today, the forensic know-how and expertise. DNA was in its infancy, so interrogation and confessions was a central part of a conviction. Jerry O'Carroll said himself, it is no tea party to be interrogated for 48 hours. It was face to face confessions. They are no confessions nowadays. Jerry O'Carroll and Superintendent John Courtney traveled all around the country solving crimes. Many detectives working in the murder squad successfully and diligently prosecuted cases within the law. Jerry, how did five people confess to crimes that they didn't commit? People confess, I'm not saying it happened in this case, to crimes they didn't commit. Guilt feelings, I don't know. Of course, the interrogation can, is hosti hostile questioning. Hostile. Aggressive. Of course. I have no problem with that. Raising voices, shouting, banging tables. Sh oh, shouting. That could certainly, banging it could involve, oh, yeah, maybe banging the table. Yeah, of course. You gave evidence in court, as PJ Brown gave evidence in court, that that never happened. Where? In the Kerry Babies case. I never, didn't I tell you everyone is different? Jesus Christ, you're not going to be shouting at a little girl and banging tables for Joanne Hayes, for God's sake. Joanne Hayes, you said you stood by as, as PJ Brown slapped her twice across the face. Nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. Joanne Hayes and I got on like a house on fire. I was nice to that girl. I couldn't believe it. Only some had allegations of coercion, false confessions and brutality made against them. However, after the Kerry Babies case, the entire squad was disbanded. Jerry O'Carroll said they were sacrificed. They threw out the baby with the bathwater. This is not my pun, but Jerry's. Very poor taste, in my opinion. We were sacrificed. As I said, they threw out the baby with the bathwater. They scattered us to the four corners. You know, many of us who were involved in that. I was... The social pariah after it, Garda pariah. It was said by one retired judge that Gardaí around the country were sick of this squad coming in, taking over and not playing by the rules. They were basically a law unto themselves and this stood out most in the Kerry Babies case and the game was up for them after this. After a time on desk duty, Jerry O'Carroll was reinstated as a detective and later promoted from sergeant to inspector. Detective PJ Brown, after a period on desk duty also, is transferred and promoted to superintendent. Superintendent John Courtney was promoted to chief superintendent and retired in 1991. Years after the end of the Kerry Babies Tribunal, Jerry O'Carroll and PJ Brown sued Joanne Hayes after she wrote a book called My Story. It was said she used defamatory words against them in the book and it was settled out of court. They each received £17,500 and a public apology. They both said they suffered gravely in their character and reputation. Of course it's forgotten what they did to Joanne and her family. In 1996, Superintendent John Courtney wrote a memoir called It Was Murder. In it he describes allegations of a Garda heavy gang beating up prisoners and innocent people as scurrilous. Jerry O'Carroll agrees. He denied the existence of a so-called heavy gang. He stated, We were good interrogators. We put the fear of God into people, but we never touched them. To that extent, they might regard us as the heavy gang. 
Joanne took out a high court action against the state to have the findings of the Kerry Babies Tribunal report overturned. It had stated while she had no connection to baby John, she did actually kill baby Shane with a bath brush and choked him to death, even though forensic evidence could not establish whether the baby had achieved independent life and there was no physical evidence of the baby having any injuries. In 2018, after waiting more than three decades, Gardaí and the state finally apologised and acknowledged their errors in the case. The Gardaí's own forensic evidence confirmed that Joanne was not the mother of baby John. In 2020, the tribunal findings are finally overturned, 36 years in the waiting. Joanne's solicitor secured a high court declaration that any findings or wrongdoings against the Hayes families were unfounded and that their constitutional rights had been breached. Joanne was awarded 1.5 million euro. Kathleen, Ned and Mike each received 100,000 euro each for being wrongfully arrested and being charged with concealment of the birth of a baby. Joanne's daughter Yvonne received 100,000 euro also. The then Taoiseach Justice Minister and Senior Gardaí made a public apology to the Hayes family. After the High Court order was agreed condemning the Tribunal report, that order was sent to the Library of the Dáil and is placed in the Kerry Babies Tribunal report, making it nullified. In an incident that may point to local involvement in the killing of baby John, the gravestone was destroyed in 2004 with a sledgehammer. It was not the first time the grave had been vandalised. The nature of the grave desecration may offer some guidance to who was involved in the killing of baby John. In recent years he was exhumed and fresh DNA was collected and he was reinterred on the same day with fresh flowers laid. They managed to get a full DNA profile and between modern technology of databases and old fashioned footwork the Gardaí are pulling out all the stops in order to find baby John's mother or father and potentially his murderer. The superintendent put it out there. The investigation team is totally committed to establishing the truth of the circumstances surrounding the murder of baby John.